Hey guys, welcome back to the Supplement Engineer Podcast. My name is Robert Chinetsky, as you all know. This week's episode, we're featuring another live q and I did with my good friend and mentor, Steve Shaw, on the Massive Iron YouTube channel from June 16th, 2020. This episode goes about two hours long. We field questions related to muscle building, strength gain, nutrition, general fitness, lifestyle stuff, supplementation. I hope you guys enjoy it and find some quality information. And uh, make sure to always you know, like, subscribe to stuff if you enjoy it. And uh, leave us a review if you haven't yet. Thank you and enjoy the episode. Hey, welcome to Massive Iron Live. Happy Friday, everybody. I'm here with Robert Chinetsky, the supplement engineer, and we will be on uh, for a couple hours or until we fall asleep. I think Robert's a little sleep deprived this morning, and I'm not doing the best myself, but we're here to answer your questions. Robert, how are you doing? As you mentioned, a, a little bit sleep deprived. Now, we've got a, a daughter that's turning three on Sunday. And, you know, most parents would say it's probably because of the kid that you're not sleeping well. And that, that's actually she sleeps really, really well. Like she sleeps longer than I do. Um, I just I get an idea in my head or I see a light and or my brain is just a buzz or, you know, with a flurry of activity and I can't fall back asleep. So, you know, the past couple of mornings, I think the latest I've slept this week has been like 5, 5.15. Outside of that, it's just I, I wake up and I can't shut my brain down. So then I, I just go to work or watch Netflix for, you know, an hour or two until uh, the halfling wakes up and I bring her to a daycare slash school. Everybody tuning in, let us know how you're doing, where you're from. If your gyms are open, what's going on, give a shout out for your city. We'd love to hear who you are. Um, man, Robert, I'll tell you, like, my life is 24 hours a day lifting, lifting, lifting. Like, I can't escape lifting questions and that's that's a blessing but yeah. sometimes i wake up at like three in the morning and i have this obsession with uh with uh uh, uh alien life so i'm i'm always mm-hmm. processing like how would we best communicate how would we best see the universe um <laughs> that's where my mind goes at like 4 a.m uh <laughs> so that's that's the crazy stuff have you stumbled upon any ways to uh, elicit the communications necessary to touch extraterrestrial life uh no not really the 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 uh the uh technology required to communicate would far be far beyond what we would ever uh imagine so let's see what we got this morning we got uh dl chiming in are you vegan yet not yet dl not yet but you can tune in every week we appreciate you uh uh tuning in and joining us and uh we will not be vegan unless all of the cows and chickens die. No, um, I eat copious amounts of vegetables each day. I eat probably close to three pounds of vegetables every day. Does that qualify me as, you know, plant-centric eating? Yeah, I would say I'm about as plant-strong as you get. If people would see how many vegetables and fruits I eat, they'd probably be uh, pretty amazed. Ben on Adventure Friday crew, what's going on, Big Ben? We got Woodulus from Scotland. Gyms <laughs> shut forever. Woodulus, I'm looking. I want to move to Scotland. We talk about it every day. Where we look at properties and we want to move there six months out of the year, and that's not helping. They need. Well, I could move my home gym equipment to uh, Scotland, but it's probably cheaper to buy it there. That's where you, you got to go for like the Highland game stuff when you go to Scotland, Steve. You got to start wearing a kilt and do a caber toss and all that stuff. I mean, it, you got to just lift rocks out there. You can't bring gym equipment. That's, that's foreboding. Yeah. Just chasing sheep and flipping <laughs> rocks. <laughs> like Would you list, what is, since you're a Scot, what are some of your favorite scotches? Which, which ones? Uh, so I'm a bourbon man, but I, I you know, I, I, I'd like to dabble in scotch. So which ones are, are not too peaty for me? So um, just before we dive in guys, we will be here for about two hours. Post up your questions. Nothing is off limits. Diet, nutrition, supplementation, workout stuff. Um, just a note, if we do not get to your question, please understand we are. if we don't see your question or read your question, it's not us, it's YouTube. Every single week I get people emailing me or complaining via DM that I'm missing their question. There's nothing I can do about it. I'm sorry. This is the way YouTube is. So if we miss your question, post it up again today. Before I get into the fray, Robert is a supplement engineer. He was, if there is any expert in the supplement industry, uh, Robert is one of them. You can find his podcast, his YouTube, his Instagram, his website at the supplement engineer. Please check out his podcast. It is one of the best, 
best in the industry, and that's not an understatement. Uh, let's see, we got Frank Pleto. Hi, how's it going, Frank? Scott McEarlene. Gyms in Scotland still shut. We're looking at late July. Needless, uh, but I don't make the rules. Unfortunately, um, people were actually trying to warn me, don't move to Scotland because of the politics. I'm like, have you seen the United States lately? I mean, seriously. Yeah, even down to the, the city level, man, it's it's absurd. The, the massive overreaches that government has taken in the past three to four months. Yeah, I mean, on one hand, you have politicians, and I don't want to get into politics, but you have politicians uh, going crazy with COVID. On the other hand, uh, who's protecting the inner cities? I mean, you know, protesting, great. Um, no one's against protesting, but some of the stuff going on in inner cities, I, I don't want to go near them. So. Yeah. Uh, Buffalo. Buffalo, New York. Gyms are not open here yet. It's like a third world country in Buffalo. What's going on? Uh, it's crazy to me that so many gyms are not open. Uh, Slim says build a home gym. It's probably hard in uh, Scotland even to, to, you probably have to drive a couple hours just to find uh, some good gym equipment. Yep. Uh, let's see. Arun, hey guys, gyms in Montreal opening on Monday. That is, uh, that is a good uh, reason to celebrate. Father's Day weekend coming up, guys. Uh, I imagine you guys will be doing some some whiskey, some bourbon, some cigars, some good stuff. So if you got anything on tap, uh, special, let us know so we can uh, enjoy the cigar or alcohol porn. Uh, Robert, Scott says, try the Scapa whiskey. Okay. I'll, I will give I'll give that a look-see at uh, our local retail supplier and see if I can find Scapa Scapa. Scapa Scapa. What do we got here? Uh, Seawick 314. I'm just working out from home now. Bowflex dumbbells up to 90 pounds. I'm glad you have dumbbells up to 90 pounds. And body weight exercises with a stationary bike. I'm trying to lose weight. Do you think that is enough? Uh, Seawick, honestly, you don't need any uh, Bowflex or dumbbells to lose weight. Um, all you need is a calorie deficit and uh, consistency with your diet. Um, you know, lifting... Lifting is a long-term investment, you know, for, for body composition. Um, it'll help your metabolism over the long run, help it. It's not a miracle. Um, but, you know, all you really need is a hiking trail and a calorie deficit. Robert, any thoughts? Uh, I, great choice on the, the Bowflex Select Tex. I mean, that's of the two kind of uh, home dumbbell sets that are, you know, keep things kind of compact that you can choose between the Power Blocks and the Select Tex. Um, I've got a set of the power block that go up to 90 pounds. The Selectex, they're okay. I like their handles a little bit better than the power blocks, but the the rotating dial makes it kind of funky to, to line them up and do a quick change. I guess you just need to get more proficient at it. But yeah, absolutely. 90 pound dumbbells and body weight with a bike, that's, you, you got everything there to make, make gains for a long time. And uh, like Steve said, it's weight loss is about calories in, calories out. The, the resistance training is there too. Um, provide the stimulus for your body to hold on to that lean mass while you're in the midst of a caloric deficit. I will say this, Seawick, um, when it comes to dumbbells, I would almost, uh, in, in a, you know, a uh, gun to my head, I'd almost rather have dumbbells and body weight exercises than a barbell and body weight exercises, because I, I feel like you can, you have more options with dumbbells. Um, I feel like when you're training at home, you know, if you have, if you don't have a spot or dumbbells, you know, are more forgiving, you can drop the weight on, uh, um, you know, a, a dumbbell bench press, that sort of thing. But gun to head, if somebody said, Hey man, you only get a barbell or dumbbell and body weight exercises, I would probably do dumbbells and nineties are a really good place to be because, um, a really good amount of weight to have because you can get up to nineties on bench for like twenties. And if you can do those for three or four sets, that's all the weight you'll ever ever need yeah if you can do bulgarians for sets of 10 holding holding those 90s i mean shit you, you'll, you'll be pretty strong yeah be careful saying bulgarians because i i just twitched a little bit that reminds me of the athlean x and greg Dusset. uh oh, God. The, yeah i think athlean x can do bulgarians with 90s um so yeah. that, that just reminded me of that so uh, all right what do we got would you list? That's a that's a word that I don't want to pronounce, Robert. <laughs> Buna Habhain. <laughs> Buna Habhain. 
12 year old but you gotta sound like a drunk scott when you're saying it so i'm sure it, it's probably like marine or something like that so I have, yeah. I have no idea how to say that no i've never heard of that uh you know unfortunately when we went to scotland we had the goal of running uh 100k in 10 days and we didn't realize that scotland was so dramatic with the elevation changes like mm-hmm. everywhere um so it made it hard to get 100k but anyway we we spent so much time trying to find trails to run on that we didn't drink any scotch so i'm sad to say yeah if you move to scotland plan to row a boat over to norway if i move to scotland i'm probably going to see the entire uh you know uh i'm going to see every country in europe and hike every mile so you you can, you can guarantee that uh been on adventures with the uh entry into smart assery uh robert is creatine safe lol Yep, by the uh, the LOL demarcation, then yeah, ben, Ben's pretty good that he knows that creatine is safe, provided you do not have any kind of pre-existing kidney issues, as we've touched on before. Yeah, you're good. I got to tell you, Robert, uh, sometimes I wake up and I hope that we'll find a new supplement that is on par with creatine, so we'll have yeah. something else to talk about. Yeah, there's one of the the podcasts I, I listen to is the Stronger by Science podcast, which if people want to learn about some like lifting stuff or get really into like the research side of uh, like strength training and some of the supplementation things that go along with that, give a that's that's a really top quality podcast. But they always talk about their scale of judging a new supplement when it bursts on the scene is uh, from zero to creatine. (laughs) So like creatine is the benchmark for everything else is like woefully below that, except maybe you could say like caffeine. Yeah. Speaking of caffeine, um, we are hyper caffeinated. If you can see that we're ready to go. Uh, Post up your questions, guys, post them up now. No stupid questions. Honestly, uh, post them up diet training, nutrition, supplementation off topic. I think we've addressed star Wars versus aliens. uh, The uh, superheroes, uh, communicating with uh, extraterrestrial life. Um, I don't think we've dove into porn yet, so if you have any porn questions, please uh, uh, feel free to open that door. I did have somebody, uh, I did have two inquiries this week. Somebody on Instagram asked if I would get on Skype and pose for cash. I turned that offer down. Uh, uh, um, and then uh, somebody got mad at me because I wear, my shirts are too baggy in videos, so... Um, I, I think I need to strip. It's funny when you're a power lifter, if you ha- take your shirt off, the few videos I've taken my shirt off, mm-hmm. people get angry. Like they get, I get these gay comments like gay hair. What are you doing? Put your shirt back on. But then, you know, you look at like Greg Doucette and athlete X who walk around with their shirt off and like everybody flocks to them. Like they were the Pied Piper just because they're, you know, yeah. so. Uh, yeah. Steve, you, you touched on uh, sci-fi stuff a second ago. I'm, I wanted to ask you, were you a, a Trekkie? Did you like Star Trek at all? If so, did you like the old movies, the old TV shows, or do you like the newer – did you like that newer trilogy they did with Chris Pine and when they kind of revamped and had that alternate timeline? Um, I was a big fan of the original, you know, because back in the day um, when we had three channels, literally, you know, you would have things like – the Twilight Zone and Star Trek, and mm-hmm. that was you know, old school monster movies. Even stuff like Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. Yeah. Back then, you know, you'd you'd look for it. I was a big fan of that. Um, the new Star Trek was okay with me, you know, with Picard and all that. I, I didn't mind it. Uh, I didn't find it. I wasn't as fascinated with it as I was the original Star Trek. I believe there was it Babylon Five or the the uh, what was the uh, five year series or the uh uh five season series i forget um i liked that one but that was kind of an offshoot i don't know how about you now i would did i i've seen a few of the original series like the william shatner one um i didn't watch much of next generation i mean i was a kid when that came on i remember my dad watching it a lot um i've seen a few of the star trek movies and I, I like the, the newer trilogy that they did, kind of where they made that alternate universe timeline thing. I just, that was, it was a good blend of, of sci fi and action. I think they did justice to kind of the original uh, characters and the, the original Star Trek series while injecting a little bit, uh, some updates to it overall. Yeah, overall, I, I would say I'm mostly, um, 
my, my biggest fascination is with the alien environment, mm -hmm. uh, the alien movies. But, you know, with Prometheus, the alien movies were always gritty and, um, yep. you know, gray and drab and green and, and, and you know, gr you know, just gritty and warlike and uh, vast, you know. Right. Then Prometheus destroyed it. It was like, uh, you know, it was it was like the 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 equivalent of a COVID nineteen, where everything was scrubbed and squared away, and uh, you know. So I had not seen that one. I've seen all the other Aliens, I believe. I just had never saw Prometheus. As a standalone sci fi film, it's pretty good, but you know, it it doesn't really fit the Alien, uh, you know, universe. Not for me. All right, Frank Plito, now that gyms are closed with limited weight, how would I how would recommend training? Uh, Frank, over on my website, Super Living Today, which is right above my fat finger here, uh, if you go to the workouts, there is a free workout PDF. I put together some home workouts, and you can check that out. That's absolutely free. All you got to do is drop in your email so you can get the PDF download and um, no cost. If you want a custom workout, I provide that service as well. Robert um, Robert also provides a supplement assessment service uh, over on my website, uh, which is, again, above my head. And if you want to save money on your supplements, yep, right over there. I can't figure it out. Like Alan, Alan's always like, click the, sub, you know, the subscriber button. Yeah. Um, so yeah, Robert provides a supplement assessment service over at my website right there. So, uh, yeah, anyway, let's move on. Uh, slim Co COVID is getting all burned up, uh, courtesy of Antifa. Uh, I just saw, um, you know, I just saw something funny on Fo uh, a screenshot of Fox news. I don't really watch, uh, news, but it said that protesting is okay. Protesting or uh, uh, protesting is okay, but you should continue to close your businesses down. But um, you can go out and protest as long as you're in a mask. So I don't know. It's all way confusing. I, I we need a rule book for 2020. Yeah, and Beverly Hills has now banned protests, so that's convenient too. Where all the Hollywood celebrities live, that's uh, that's awfully convenient. Yeah, that was probably the most hilarious story of the week. Uh, uh, Beverly Hills, like they're funneling. You know, millions of dollars of celebrities are into uh, bailing out uh, the protesters. But then they say, eh, just don't protest here if you don't mind. Right. Right. All right. Lewis Hoodie. Hello, guys. Any tips for posterior delts? It's the only muscle I can't develop properly. Robert, I'm going to let you start before I beat my drum. Um, pulling exercises, definitely. So you can do uh, like wide grip seated cable rows if you have access to a gym. If you're not, use some resistance bands. And so instead of doing like pulling down to your sides with a neutral grip or an underhand grip, get your arms out to the sides and pull back that way. That'll get the rear delts involved. Uh, Athlean X is always face pulls will help develop the rear delts. Uh, bent over rear delt flies, basically any other back move. Pull-ups are going to recruit the rear delts to a certain degree. Inverted rows will do that. Dumbbell rows will do that. But if you're looking for something that will really like zone in on those, look for rear delt flies, face pulls, and those those high seated cable rows where you're almost pulling your arms out to the side and like you're pulling almost at like nipple level. Yeah, you know, um, one thing, I mean, I'm a, I'm a fan of face pulls and I'm a fan of uh, bent over dumbbell rows and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, I think lost in the equation, we get the, uh, the foundation that most people have weak rowing, uh, weak, weak rows, weak dumbbell rows, weak barbell rows. The back is one of the strongest muscle groups in the human body and capable of a lot. And so many guys that are obsessed, uh, when, when guys come to me with rear delt um, questions, the first thing I ask is, let's let's talk about your baseline. How, how, how strong are your rows? And, you know, you have to focus on your rows uh, as, as a cornerstone. Um, because if you consider like the, the face pull, I don't know if you can see it here. You consider the face pull movement. Where are we? You know, it, you're, you're going like this, right? You're moving the elbow back. Well, a row isn't too much, uh, isn't too far off that path. And you need to, you know, you need to do your rear delt work. You need to do your isolation work, but you also need to get your row strong. So that's, that's my soap box. Um, Robert, here we go. Had this one last week. How often should I cycle caffeine? 
Uh, I mean, if, if you want to go with like the, the research backed answer, there really is no reason to have to cycle caffeine. Really, it kind of boils down to your personal usage and tolerance and habituation and how addicted to it are you? I mean, it, are you up, do you need upwards of like 900 milligrams to 1000 milligrams of caffeine a day just to feel like a human being? In that instance, yeah, you might want to consider cycling caffeine. But if you're only having like one cup of coffee a day or like a scoop of a, a pre-workout that only has caffeine in it, I, I don't really see the need to, to cycle caffeine. Now, if you're using it and you're like you're addicted to it in every hour and a half, two hours, three hours, you're needing to like re-up and have another bump of caffeine, have another energy drink, uh, coffee, tea, something like that, or you know, a no-dose tab or something like that, then you might want to invest into uh cycling off create uh, cycling off caffeine uh, and lowering your intake uh, at a minimum you know if, if you do have a super high intake of it you know maybe four to six weeks if you really want to get down to like base levels all, all again so but I wouldn't recommend going cold turkey if you are at such a high dose of caffeine intake like you're at that 800 900 a thousand milligram intake real don't drop down to no caffeine that that's going to be a miserable experience for 90, 95% of the population. Um, start by like slowly tapering it down over a couple of weeks. So if you're used to having like three cups of coffee a day, cycle down to like two cups of coffee, then one cup of coffee, then maybe like decaf coffee, and then you can go without it. And then give that, you know, a couple of weeks of no caffeine. Um, and then you can kind of, you know, ramp back up again if you want to. But if you if your caffeine intake is, you know, four to five hundred a day or less, I don't really see a need to cycle it. And there's not really any conclusive or convincing evidence showing that you need to cycle off caffeine. Yeah, you know, we touched on this a little bit last week, but some of us um, that come off caffeine uh, struggle a lot more than than others. Like for me, if I don't slowly have my dose, uh, I get really, really bad headaches and, and whereas some people don't. So um yeah. You know, I've tried to cycle off caffeine and invariably, you know, somewhere along the line, I have one of those days where I wake up and I'm like, you know, my ass is kicked. And the first thing you think about mentally is caffeine, coffee, and energy drink. There's right. so much cycle. There's so many psychological ties to caffeine that I right. find that very, very interesting. Um Almost, almost like a crutch. But I will say that in periods of time where I've been having, uh, relying heavily on caffeine, sometimes when I get off of caffeine, I actually feel better when I wake up in the morning. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm not, I can't really say why that is. I just feel a little bit less foggy, a little bit less, uh, you know, crazy in the morning. Yeah. Well, it's probably due to the way caffeine works. So what caffeine resembles the molecular structure of a denison. And so adenosine is a, a neurotransmitter in the body that at least in the brain induces fatigue. So during the day, it builds up extracellularly. And then at night, you know, it's, it binds to those receptors and that's what makes you tired. Well, what caffeine does, it's going to block the adenosine molecule from binding to its receptor since it's got a molecular structure similar to adenosine. So it binds to that receptor. And all what, what happens is that adenosine just keeps building up and building up and building up until when the, the caffeine finally gets out of your system. If you're getting really addicted to caffeine, it's like the floodgates open and you're just awash in adenosine. So after you start cycling off caffeine and you stop using it, you stop having that huge buildup of adenosine. So that may help to even you out a little bit more and kind of recalibrate you to where you feel a little bit more normal once you've kind of broken completely away from caffeine. That makes sense a lot. Hey, uh, what do we got here? Philo 68. Bourbon versus scotch. That's a very, very good question. Um, you know, bourbon, single malt, quality all day. Uh, by law, it's protected in the best spirit in the world. Um, I am right here close to Kentucky. And a lot of the Kentucky uh, bourbons, I, I, I'm, I'm going to say I'm not a huge fan of a lot of the big staples. Um, we have one of the best bourbon bars in uh, the country, uh, the Prohibition Bar in Covington, Kentucky, and I'm friends with a gentleman. Tried a lot of uh, bourbons. One of my favorites, uh, you know, I'm a big favorite uh, fan of whiskeys and bourbons. Uh, just diving into the scotch world myself, so I can't really give a good comparison. But what do you prefer, uh, you know, Robert, when it comes to whiskey, bourbon, and scotch? A bourbon, hands down. Um, my entry into the uh, whiskey, bourbon, you know, dark fire water category was uh jack daniels so my uncle my dad never really drank 
um, in college he did, but after college there was a he he stopped to all just about, and he may have. I remember him having like maybe one beer at like pool parties we'd have, but outside of that, he never drank a whole lot. And so his younger brother, my uncle, it, it loves Jack Daniels, and so we would go out on his pontoon boat, and he would always have a, a handle of Jack or Gentleman Jack would be like the Christmas present we gave him. Um, and so I, I drank drank to that, and eventually graduated up into liking uh, bourbons, maybe three or four years ago. It's, I, I, w- I was never a big drinker in, in college. I did like the cheap beer for beer pong and all of that stuff. And I kind of went through a craft beer phase, you know, 2010, 2011, but it's only within like the last three years or so that I've really started to get uh, more serious about bourbon and scotch tasting and all of that. But I, it's, it, for, for me, it's, it's bourbon all day long. I will say, you know, for anybody that dives into that world, for me, um, you know, like being so close to Kentucky, there's a lot of crap bourbons, you know, so yeah. I found um, when I dove into that world that, you know, I, there's a big wide variety of, of quality and you can taste the difference. I mean, some of the cheap Kentucky stuff is like drinking, you know, the cheap piss beer, you know, that you drink at college. Oh, yeah. And you can taste, uh, you can taste the difference. It's, it's, you know, not good on the palate and it's kind of off putting and you don't really want to sip it. Um, but you go to the other end of the spectrum and it's a whole different world diving into ha- having been on that side of bourbon. When I got into scotch, I started looking for reputable scotches instead of just getting the cheapest crap. Mm-hmm. And, uh, You know, I can't really tell right now. I can't really tell as much nuance between scotches as I can between bourbons, but I'm still getting there. Yeah, I just it's the peatiness of scotch that I I don't find appealing. If if you do a little splash of water with it, I I can handle it a little bit more that way. But I I can't do most scotches just raw. I don't mind either as long as I got a good cigar and. no one blowing up my DM box. All right, what do we got here? Ben out Adventures. Happy Father's Day weekend to all the dads out there. I hope this doesn't offend anyone. Oh, wait, we're not on Facebook. You're safe, Ben. This is a safe space. This is a uh, 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 an autonomous zone for uh, safe people of, of everything. So you can say whatever you want here, and uh, we you're safe, absolutely 100% safe. Wait, I, I don't think the uh, I don't think Chaz is Chaz anymore because they realize being autonomous is too difficult. So I believe they're Chop now. Chop. Uh, we're autonomous. Can you bring us some phone chargers, please? Um, <laughs> best training split: full body, upper, lower, or bro? Uh, go right ahead. I got to get my dog to stop doing what you're doing. Hey, uh, Carlos, it's going to be. There really is no best training split. It's going to be the one that uh, motivates you to get in the gym and do things most consistently and most regularly with your training. The one that excites you to get in the gym and get after the weights each week. There is It doesn't matter if it's upper, lower, full body. At the end of 20, 30, 40 years of training, it's all going to even out in the long run. Just find a program that you know, jives with your availability and your desire to train. So if you don't want to be in the gym six hours a day, six days a week, don't pick like a twice a day training routine, push, pull, leg split. If you only have three days or if your recovery sucks because you're getting older or you're, you have a really high stress job and you've got a lot of obligations in your life, go with a three day full body split or, you know, do an upper, lower ABA kind of thing where you're doing upper Monday, uh, lower Wednesday, upper Friday, and then the next week it would be lower, upper, lower. Uh, so, you know, there there really is no best, especially just for, you know, average guys like us that just really enjoy lifting. It's about finding a program that excites you, that motivates you, that wants you, that gets you to want to be in the gym more often than not. Yeah, you know, um, I, I've taken my share of beatings and poundings over the years uh, for the things that I say, but um, if you're one of these guys that only looks at one variable when it comes to full body training and you just pound the frequency drum and you miss the bigger picture, oh, yeah. you, you're not doing yourself, uh, you know, you're not, you know, you, you're closed minded. Um, you need to, you need to open your mind a little bit and understand that it's very complex, um, that there's variables that can't be quantified by science. and you know, when we focus on one variable, there's there's positives and negatives to everything. 
Um, there's also, you know, uh, older individuals might not work best with frequency training. Uh, frequency training isn't very forgiving when it comes, you know, you can't really fit in junk volume into frequency training, but that means you have to focus more on compound movements and that can be harder for older, over older trainees. Uh, full body can be harder, uh, when you get strong because you have so many damn warm up sets that it can take forever. Um, and really the bottom line is that if you are, if you have a good exercise selection, you have a reasonable amount of volume and you don't have a lot of junk volume and you have progressive overload over the span of three, four, five years, you, it's going to all shake out. It's going to all, you know, it doesn't matter, you know, if if your bike has two wheels or three, you're still going to go from New York to Philadelphia and you're going to get there. Um, so don't don't get caught up in this stuff. We get caught up in all these things and people get far more caught up in this debate than they do their own strength levels and their own their own programming. So you can give me any program and I can fix it up and get you on track to maximize it. But you know what, Robert, and this is the God's honest truth, if I give somebody a program that's going to put them on the path from A to B, you know, 95% of the people aren't going to do it. They're just going to, you know, yeah. they're, they're going to want something magical or something sexier or they're, they'll are they stop going to the gym, et cetera. Right. All right. Seawick, you guys are awesome. Thank you, Seawick. I appreciate it. Thanks for asking my question, answering my question. I hope you guys have a great weekend you too as well all right would you list from scotland another entry called buna bin i think that's the pronunciation for the uh that really complicated b-a-h-h-a-b-u-i-b-n oh, yeah, so. yeah, gotcha. i thought we had another uh another, <laughs> another scotch i was getting excited here for a moment buna bin actually sounds very australian to me that's something i would ex ex expect an australian to say uh, John, Mississippi here, been been uh, back in the, in the gym for over a month now. They were closed for three months. Glad to see you back. And all right, this is completely out of my wheelhouse right here, Robert. Uh, one Punch Man versus Fist of the North Star. I, yes. No clue. I, I mean, is, is, I'm wondering if this is like an old kung fu action movie. I've seen no. my fair share, but I don't know either of those. Now, I actually have a One Punch Man shirt because I like the shirt. But I'm not going to lie. I have no idea who he is. Uh, I actually saw somebody on my social media with a One Punch Man shirt. And I'm like, that shirt looks awesome. And I had no idea it was a thing. So I'm we're gonna probably going to take, yeah, we're gonna take a beating here, Robert. Uh, Seawick, I purchased your Massive Iron book and will be using one of your workouts. Thank you, Seawick. I appreciate it. Anybody that wants to uh, check out Massive Iron can head over to my website, which is right above my head. All right. Okay. All One right. Punch Man is a, uh, it looks like a Japanese anime yeah, or manga. Extremely yeah. popular from what I can tell. Um, let you guys know, we'll stay on as long as you have questions to so keep them rolling. Uh, diet, training, nutrition, supplementation, off topic. We really don't care. It's Friday. Just entertain us. Say something humorous or funny, or at least try. Yeah. Uh, Jim Bro, Robert, what's your daily process for making sure you take all of your supplements? I'm a creature of habit, so it's it's kind of a a routine and a regimen that's evolved as I've just been. I'm a creature of habit, so I do the same thing just about every damn day. Um, so I, I wake up, I'll uh, go get dressed, get get the halfling dressed, take her to to daycare, come home, Santa and I'll go on a walk for an hour or so. I don't take any supplements really until I have my uh, scoop of nootropic or pre-workout, which is what's in here. And the time of day that I take that is anywhere between 10 and 12.30, depending on what time Sandy and I are going to train. So her, her and I will go train after uh, Steve and I hop off of this call. And plus, I you know slept maybe four hours last night, so I need a little extra caffeine bump to get me going. Make sure I, I speak coherently to all of you fine people watching this. Um, after that, I usually go into my workouts fasted, so I'll have some kind of intra workout carb powder with some amino acids. Um, now, I, I have the luxury of having some of these products sent to me to, for testing, and, and other companies that I work with just send me stuff. Um, if I didn't have those, would I pay for them? 
Probably not. I would probably just use uh, a whole foods meal before training, but since I've got them here, I'm, I'm going to use them uh, just because I don't, there's no magic to amino acid supplements or intra workout carbs, especially if you're not competing twice a day or involved in like field sports or also, like an all day long soccer tournament or CrossFit event or something like that. Um, after training is when I'll do, uh, if I, if I have time to fix lunch, um, I'll mix up some, uh, amino acids with a scoop of creatine or have one of my flavored creatine supplements. I'll do that. Um, and if I don't have time to eat like today, after we get finished training, I'll be recording another podcast. So I'll just have, you know, two scoops of protein powder and I'll throw my creatine into that. Um, and then at night I'll just take my multivitamin and fish oil along with my dinner. And that's about it. That's that there's nothing too fancy about it. I don't do a whole lot of stuff. It's, it's either a pre-workout or a nootropic. There are a few other bulk things that I throw in there, uh, on occasion, like rhodiola powder or, uh, KSM 66 or some adaptogens. But outside of that, that's, that's about as fancy as I get. You know, people often ask me and my wife, how we uh, manage to fit in everything we do into a day. And we literally have everything down to like a, uh, a core, uh, you know, a Chore- you know, the choreography is is spot on. Like, mm-hmm. um, I will get up, and I'm always first out of bed. And not yeah. to be too graphic, but I'll go sit on the throne. And while I'm sitting on the throne, um, she's getting our supplements ready. So I have my two gummies and my, my D3 and my K2 and, you know, all my stuff. I get up. That stuff's all ready to go. Um, you know, so... People ask us a lot, you know, how we manage to squeeze everything into a day. Like everything is choreographed. Everything is, you know, strict. We have routines and habits that we do uh, so we don't have to guess or plan or whatever. Yeah. And I'm sure you guys are pretty much the same way. Absolutely. Yeah, we are. We, Santa and I are both uh, very, very much creatures of habit. We like structure. We like routine. And so, uh, yeah, that's that's the biggest key for success is just finding a routine that that jives well and one that you enjoy and, and work it. Now, Robert, I, I mentioned this on um, you know Instagram yesterday about excuses and time management. Mm-hmm. I had a client leave this week because he said he doesn't have time to work out, and you know when 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 one of my clients tells me that stuff, you know I just let him go. I mean it's. It's not my point if somebody is at the, the place where they want to stop services for me yeah. to say, you know, you're full of shit, you know. Right. Um, because generally they know they're full of shit. They're just not ready to change. But, um, you know, regarding making a plan, if you're winging it, if you're winging it in life, like you don't have a plan, you don't, you know, you don't have a time to work out, you don't, you know, plan your meals or whatever – you're going to waste a lot of time fucking around uh, and wasting your own time. And that time could be better served, uh, you know, doing something else. Would you agree, Robert? Absolutely. Yeah. Winging it very rarely works in any, any aspect of life, be it school, be it your, your training, your nutrition uh, job. It, you know, winging it very, very rarely works. You, You have to be adaptable and be willing to, roll with the punches to a certain extent, but you also always have to go in with some kind of game plan too. How many of you out there work at a, in an office environment where somewhere around 10 o'clock, everybody peeks their head out of their little cubicle and they start to try to decide what they're going to have for lunch. And really from 10 o'clock to like 11, 15, all it is is a, you know, fuck around uh, hour where everybody's trying to figure out what they're going to do for lunch each day. That was engineering. That was what the, uh, that was what it was like in the consulting field or at least the engineering offices I worked in. Yeah. I mean, it was even like that at Tiger Fitness. I mean, we, we only had a small group of people and I had, I sat back in my office, but every single day it was like the same time. What are we going to do for lunch? What are we going to do for lunch? And, um, that's kind of what, if people don't plan, they're, they're wasting so much time going through that. What are we going to do for lunch? When am I going to get time to work out? Uh, that sort of thing. Yeah. All right, John, I have the original Star Trek series on VHS. That's pretty impressive. Awesome. Um, I won't lie, I have some VHS tapes lying around. Uh, when I was a pro wrestler, I have uh, the tape where I lost my belt, where I was supposed to wrestle King Kong Bundy. I'd like to get that, uh, upload that one day to this channel just to prove to people I'm not full of shit. Um, but, Robert, Robert, you got any VHS lying around? 
Who here? No. At my parents' house? Yeah, we have a shit ton. I'm pretty sure they still have all the VHSs we had from when we were kids. By the time I moved out onto my own, the DVD craze was in full swing. So we still got some DVDs here at the house. Um, and my parents have all the old VHS things and like the Nintendo cartridges and Super Nintendo cartridges and all that good stuff. Yeah, I remember like, you know, the TV phases. We we had DVDs hit and then Blu-ray and then uh, what was the next next gen that they pushed for a while? Um, uh, I'm trying to remember. I, I don't I don't freaking know. It, it, no, it never, and everything's streaming now, more or less. It never went anywhere. And like it's kind of funny, you know, when we we went from all this high quality, high definition home theater stuff to streaming, which you know, I got the fastest everything, and still when the movie gets dark, you can kind of see all the pixels and shit and yep. stuff. Yeah, I much prefer having physical media, be it uh, you know, actual DVDs or um a paperback book. I, I I never want to purchase a Kindle or an e-reader. I cannot stand reading things off my laptop. If it's like a, a, the study of a new ingredient that's coming out and they've got a bunch of different literature that the company will send me to review, I go and print it all out on our printer. I, I cannot stand reading stuff like that on a, a laptop or any kind of a tablet or yeah. you know electronic device. Give me, give me paper. I'm the same way. I've tried the Kindle. I've had a Kindle. Uh, I've tried the digital stuff. Um, I even have a subscription to the uh, Marvel Unlimited where I can go on and look at all the comic books for nine ninety nine a month. And, um, you know, looking at it on the computer, you know, just doesn't cut it for me. Yeah. But I still keep the subscription because I'm a dumbass. <laughs> all right, Andre, is three to five grams of creatine daily enough when over 200 pounds or should I go higher? Uh, five, I would err on the side of five grams. You're, you're a bigger guy. So stick with the five grams a day and yeah, you'll be fine with that. There's no need to go higher. You could in all safety, but I would just stick at the five and you'll be all right. Thank you, Robert. Uh, Galen Burke, the second star Wars was King. I won't lie. When it came out in theaters, I went and saw it probably two or three times. Um, but I also saw aliens two or three times and King Kong in 1976. Um, I will tell you a little personal story, if you guys don't mind, for a second. It was the 1976 Super Bowl Sunday. I believe 1976, and I might be a year off. But it was Pittsburgh and Los Angeles. But it was also the weekend King Kong came out, okay? I believe it was the weekend King (coughs) Kong came out, but I know King Kong was out of theaters. And I've never, I've only thrown one tantrum in my life. I was nine years old. I threw the, actually I was eight. I threw the mother of all tantrums and screamed bloody murder in my room to get my mom to take me to see King Kong on Super Bowl Sunday. And you know what? My mom complied and she sat through the movie and uh, I'll, I'll, you know, for the rest of my life, I've been making it up to her. So. <laughs> I will agree. I'm going to, I'm going to caveat Galen's uh, comment there. The original trilogy was King. The The prequels were okay. The 7, 8, and 9 that Disney shit all over, I, I'm not even considering that Star Wars. Yeah, I won't even lie. Uh, the first three movies I've watched, um, I think I've watched the next three, but I don't even remember them. I mean, yeah. that's my level of interest. Yep. Uh, Bruce Lee from Greece. Uh, Bruce Lee from Greece. Hope you guys are doing all right during these crazy times. We're doing, uh, I'm doing okay. Um, the biggest stress for me, and I'm curious what you think, Robert, is waking up every day and feeling like like your country is vastly different from where it was a year ago. And that's not a commentary on the protesting or anything, but things feel really weird right now, and it's a, it's a super source of stress for me. Yeah, I think I just it's it's to the point now where just, normal conversations just irritate me because it seems like the average person has lost the ability to discern things and think for themselves. They're just being, they're eating everything up that's being fed to them from news outlets, from social media, from politicians. And nobody's stopping to think, okay, here's what we're actually seeing in the data. This is what's really going on. And nobody, everybody's just kind of, and when I say everybody, I'm just saying talk, I'm making generalizations here. 
that mass flocks of people are just kind of buying everything hook, line, and sinker and just going along with whatever. There's Nobody's questioning anything. The news outlets aren't holding anybody accountable as what they should be doing. They're not questioning anything. They're just simply saying, oh, well, the mayor said to do this, so we should all do this. And I'm thinking that's that's not the purpose of the news outlets. If, if you're being a real journalist, you're supposed to be digging deeper and finding out what is at the root of all of this. But the investigative journalism bit has completely been wiped away. It's it's there's it's in non-existent here in Austin at least. Yeah, I'm going to say uh, uh, SEO uh, killed journalism. And what do I mean by that? Yep. Well, look, I worked in we worked in that industry. Uh, I worked in uh, an industry where my job was to churn out articles. So there was two things I looked for: quality content. And I had to phrase that in some way where you would actually give a shit by the headline. Right. The second part, actually giving a shit by the headline. If you do a search for like muscle building tips on Google, there's 5 million articles, literally. Yeah. Um, and if you want something to stand out in that C, it doesn't matter if it's muscle building or COVID-19 uh, headlines. The reality is that you have to, do you have to flip some switch that gets somebody's attention to get them to click? Yeah. So, you know, that is that's the reality of where we're at, regardless of what you think about the COVID or the lockdowns or any uh, or the protesting or the rioting or any of this stuff going on right now. The reality is, is that reporters and, and uh, editors are chained to that. They're absolutely chained to that because it's their income stream. And for better or for worse, if they don't do something to shock you and get you to click, they don't have a job. Agreed. Agreed. That's the bottom line because Stone Cold said so. All right. Been on adventures. I just want a man of steel, too. The first man of steel with Henry Cavill was so underrated. Man, you know, it's I can't even remember when I came out. I can't. I I remember enjoying it. 2012, maybe? 2013? I liked it. I thought he did a fine job as Superman. I actually don't mind most superhero movies. Uh, you know, I find them generally more entertaining than the average other trike put out by Hollywood, but yeah. um, I like superheroes, so I'm a little bit biased. Agreed. Uh, Galen Burke, creatine reaches saturation after five grams per month. Correct, but you still need to keep taking it after that because eventually there will be a rate of decay and your body will go back to its baseline creatine level. So even after you reach saturation for a month, you'll, you'll maintain that saturation for basically a month or so, but then after then it's going to start dwindling. So yeah, once you reach saturation, just keep taking five grams a day. It's safe. It's proven effective. It has a bunch of other benefits just aside from muscle building. It's got recovery benefits, cognitive benefits, all that good stuff too. So, Robert, I'm going to throw an off-topic uh, question your way that's not from them, just between us. Uh, since we were talking about books, um, you know, and we both discussed how we don't like to read them on Kindle or digitally. Do you ever go – I do this all the time, so this is why I ask. Do you ever just go to a bookstore and wander around and just randomly purchase stuff just to, you know, just on a whim? Yeah, I mean, we've got – we bought a, a membership to the local Barnes and Noble by us because that was one of my favorite things to do as a kid was that we would go to the mall and this was when Walden Books was still around. Barnes and Noble, I don't think had invaded at least uh, Kenner, which is outside of the New Orleans metro area in Louisiana. I don't think Barnes and Noble had invaded yet. So we had Walden Books and it's like every Saturday or Sunday while my parents would go and walk around the mall because that was the phase of everybody. There were mall walkers every Saturday morning or Sunday morning. Right, right. You know, I would go in and sit there. Me and my brother did, or my sister was with us there too. And I would just sit in there and like flip through a comic book or read one of like the, the Star Wars expanded universe novels that uh, had been written. Or uh, I went through a huge Tom Clancy phase too. I, I think I read almost all of the, the Jack Ryan novels up to a certain point. Um, but yeah, I mean, even to this day, we don't watch, I mean, we don't have any tablets here at the house. I have a little laptop for work. Sandy has a laptop for her work. We don't have a, we're not giving our, our three-year-old a tablet like we see a lot of parents do. We just, that, that's, we're giving her books. She has probably 30 books and her birthday is Sunday. We're telling everybody to give her books because we enjoy it. And that's one of, if, if I'm working on a Sunday afternoon, that's one of the things Sandy does with our daughter is takes her to the bookstore. And they go and read or do story time or play with some of the little things in there. And we'll usually buy something there just to, you know, support them. You know, um, sometimes people laugh at me when I, I talk about retiring. 
and sometimes people say if I retired, I wouldn't know what to do with myself. But if I retired, I'd be sitting around with a drink in my hand, a cigar in my hand, and a book. Absolutely. I, I could give a fuck if the world eats itself. Um, I mean, that's mm -hmm. just kind of how I am. One thing about books, and I'd like to hear if there's any other book nerds out there, is like if I, if I uh, pick out a book – Hold on. I got to get my dog to shut up. It's licking its ass and very distracting. Um, that's her, her favorite hobby. Um, with books, like I found if I pick out five books uh, that look good based on ratings, mm -hmm. or if I just go into a bookstore and pick out five books, one out of the five I'll actually end up reading. And yeah. it doesn't matter if it's you know, one of the reviewed ones or one that I just picked up randomly, one of them will just randomly bite me in the ass and it might not be the one I expected. Yeah, so. it's uh, it's all good stuff. I wish, uh, I almost wish books would kind of make a, a huge comeback. I, I, I understand digitizing certain things, but, you know, I'm, I'm ready for kind of the pendulum to swing back the other way and us to almost like push back against technology a little bit and go old school with a certain, a few certain things. Well, it has happened that way um, a little bit in the recording industry. Vinyl has made a huge comeback. Yeah. And, uh, vinyl is um, alive and well. Well, I don't think anybody makes cassette tapes anymore. No. Andre, gents, if you're looking for an underrated whiskey, give Suntory Whiskey Toki. It's 50 to 60 bucks and uh, probably could be in the 150 range. Yeah, I think it's a Japanese whiskey. I believe. I know Japanese's uh, whiskey industry has exploded in the past few years. Um, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's pricey. I mean, that's that's not going to be your everyday bourbon like a a Buffalo Trace or a Knob Creek or something like that would be. But uh, yeah, I mean, that might be worth trying for a special occasion. Yeah, Robert, you have your uh, computer right there. Could you Google Whist Whistle Pig Twelve Year? I'm yep. just curious. Uh, I'm just curious what it costs down there for you because that's. That's my more expensive uh, whiskey. I'll have that like once a month because I don't want to drink that too quickly. Uh, the rye, the twelve-year rye. Yeah, twelve-year rye. Uh, total wine, and that's the uh, the big outlet by me. One hundred and twenty dollars a bottle, or ninety yeah. ninety-three dollars in this one. Yeah, that sounds about right. Whistle twig, uh, whistle pig, twelve years is something I'll have once a month. You know, that's like. Uh, that's like my splurge. So if anybody wants a good rye, that is smooth as a baby's ass. Um, it really is. You can drink it, and it uh, it's it's really smooth and really pleasant. Yeah. The 10-year the whistle pig is only $72. Yeah, I've not tried the 10, so I can't vouch for that. Yeah. Uh, let's see. What do we got here? Buffalo Sabskis. Sabskis. Opinion on vitamin D, specifically the three to four day, 50,000 milligram a day the AMA recommends. Robert, any thoughts? I don't think it's 50,000 milligrams. I think it might be 50,000 IUs. Right. Um, if the American Medical Association is recommending that with uh, and an MD identifies a, a severe clinical deficiency in a patient, I, I'm going to defer to the doctors and the, the medical authorities on that. Um, I think for an everyday person, like that's just living up north, you know, taking 3,000 to 5,000 IUs a day is probably more than enough. But if, if your body is, if you've got some kind of disorder where you, your body is lacking the, abil the ability to synthesize or properly convert vitamin D, you're probably going to need something more along the, the more intense scales like the, the 50,000 IU. But again, that's going to be prescribed only under the, the vision um, and care of a doctor. You're not going to find that a dose, you know, just on the shelf. Thank you, Robert. Uh, let's see, Louis Hoodie, big thanks from France. Thanks for joining in from France. It's uh, always good to hear where you guys are tuning in from. I'm always amazed at the wide variety of uh, the, the, the huge amount of diversity that exists in my audience. Um, it's just incredible, absolutely incredible. Uh, Slim56, do you recommend doing shoulder pressing on chest days or back days if i'm a military presses are stronger if i do them on back days um this is really, this is really kind of a crazy question i'm not making fun of your question slim but if you have a chest day, if you have a chest day and you have a back day i guess my question is why don't you have a shoulder day? um 
you know, in, in conventional uh, bro split programming, you're going to have the basic fours are uh, horizontal pressing, like bench pressing and triceps. Uh, you can, uh, and then you have back and biceps, or you can change those. You can do back and triceps, chest and biceps. I do that sometimes. And then you have legs, and then you have usually shoulders. Um, but I, I guess my question for you, Slim, is why aren't you doing a shoulder-specific day? Uh, and if not, I would probably consider doing that because I've been programming for a long, long time. I've never seen anybody put shoulder work uh, into – you can put shoulder work on a chest day, but then you have a push-pull leg split. So, uh, Robert, anything to add to this? No. I mean, you summed it up pretty well. I mean, it, it makes sense that his the presses are stronger on back day because the shoulders are going to be pre-fatigued to a certain degree if you're following uh, any kind of bench press or incline pressing because the anterior delts are going to be involved in sort of the triceps. So back day, those aren't involved to nearly the degree they are on chest day. That's why you'd be stronger on a military press. One of the things I don't like, one of my least favorite uh, splits is push-pull legs, and a lot of people like it. But the reason why I don't like it is you're able to maintain a reasonable amount of back volume and balance and leg mm -hmm. volume and balance. But then when you get to um, your pressing work, something's going to take a back seat, uh, military yeah. presses or chest presses. So, you know, I'm, I'm thinking out loud here. Uh, one thing I've Ever done right now is you'd almost be better off splitting your shoulder work onto um, you know more of a frequency in that type of environment. Maybe putting uh, a heavy press on back day uh, or something like that. But I don't know. Just thinking out loud. Yeah. What we've kind of started doing with our training is that we've got it split out to where Monday is uh, the like a body weight, more plyometric style leg day. Then Tuesday is, uh, is back and arms day. So it'll be, it'll be back. So we'll do pull-ups. We'll do inverted rows. We'll do one arm rows and then we'll do some rear delt flies with that. And then we'll do an arm superset. Wednesday is either some kind of like either we'll go on a super long walk, a hike, or do like an interval cardio thing. Thursday is, um, it's a push day, but it's an emphasis on shoulders because it's, it's vertical pressing. So we always start off with a shoulder press that day, and then we'll go into, you know, some incline presses or push ups, and then finish with uh, rear delt flies again, just because you, you almost can never work the rear delts enough. Um, arm superset to finish that off again. Friday is heavy leg day, and then Saturday is an upper body body weight workout day. So it's, it, there's no weights on that day. Um, it's, it's pull ups, it's dips, it is uh, push ups but like chest fly pushups on the suspension trainer and then inverted right. rows on the suspension trainer. Um, and that's it. So we've kind of, well, Saturday I would say is more of like a chest focused kind of pushing movements. Whereas uh, our Thursday push day is more focused on shoulders. There's still some chest work in there, but we've kind of emphasized one aspect of pushing on one day and, you know, save it for the other day. Slim, I'm just going to end cap this with, um, you know, one of the issues when you're doing uh, chest and shoulders on the same day, whether it's in the context of an AB split or a push pull legs, uh, you have to be willing to do some form of rotation. So in workout A, chest comes first. In workout B, shoulders come first. So if I'm programming a push pull legs or I'm programming an AB split that has chest and shoulders on the same day, one workout will start with a bench press variation. The other workout will start with a barbell or dumbbell overhead press variation. So if you are experiencing fatigue on your military presses, it seems to me it's very likely that you're always putting them second fiddle to your bench press. So you might want to change that up. Yeah. All right. Uh, Nigel, hey, question for the supplement engineer. Trim fast keto. Keep seeing ads for it popping up. I'm just going to say this before uh, you – jump in Robert. Anytime somebody comes to me about an ad, the thing I'm going to tell them is ignore the hype and don't buy the product. Because 99.9999% of the time when you see an ad and it's got sexy text, don't buy the product. Robert, any thoughts? Yeah, I saw this question pop up in the feed, you know, like 10 or 15 minutes ago. So, you know, while we've been answering questions, I've been trying to find the ingredients on this. And so I typed in TrimFast Keto into Google and, you know, 4,000 websites pop up 
you cannot find the ingredients to this anywhere. It is it the ingredient label is just not listed. Go look at the images pop up. Type in trim fast keto or ingredients, and then look at the images. You don't do you won't find this. What I'm going to assume that it is. I mean, if 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 the ingredient panel is that hard to find for a supplement. It is going to be massively underdosed and is most likely going to be a proprietary blend. If I had to guess what in the hell is in this bottle, since it's not clearly labeled on the website or any of the other 6,000 affiliate sites it's listed on, it's going to be a very small amount of BHB salts, which are exogenous ketones. So when you enter into a ketogenic diet, you ditch carbohydrates or you significantly reduce them to where you're only consuming around 50 grams of net carbs a day. Um, when you starve your body of glucose and it depletes its glycogen stores, it starts generating, the liver starts pumping out ketones, which can serve as an energy source for the body, and it can generate ATP from that. Um, exogenous ketones are, you know, bio-identical copies of those ketones that your body can use as a rapid source of energy. So it's like the, the keto version of a carbohydrate that provides a rapid source of energy. The issue when you take those is that it kind of defeats the purpose of taking, of using a ketogenic diet. The purpose of a keto diet is to generate ketones. So if I'm supplementing with ketones, that's going to be preventing the body from to, to a certain degree of producing its own ketones. It doesn't accelerate fat loss. If anything, it's going to make your body stop metabolizing its own fat for ketone production, and it's going to metabolize the stuff you're putting in it, just like as if you ate food, if you ate protein or carbohydrates, it's going to metabolize that first before it relies on its own energy stores. Uh, ignore this. It is a giant scam. It is a waste of money. Do not buy TrimFast Keto or any other keto supplement for that matter. The, you don't need a, a supplement on a keto diet unless you need something like fish oil, protein, or like electrolytes. But any any kind of exogenous ketone, BHB salt, it's bullshit. Yeah, exactly right. You don't need a supplement on a keto diet. You need to be in ketosis. Um, and Robert, I have a rule when somebody comes to me. If I can't find the ingredients of a supplement, online within 60 minutes or 60 seconds, you know, you should not even consider yeah. taking it. Um, Zach, thank you, Zach, for the donation. We sincerely appreciate it. Chris, Chris, it's almost midnight here in the Philippines. My question is, what's the max number of sets for each muscle group per week? Chris, Chris, I want you to travel back in time to a couple days ago. I just made a video about this called Junk Volume. And I cover that uh, pretty in-depthly. I go over what your weekly volume will look like if you do 12 to 15 sets per major muscle group, uh, et cetera. Uh, if you get into 12 to 15 uh, sets, quality sets per muscle group, you're looking at quite a bit of volume per week just to knock out if you're training four days in a row. That can keep you in the gym quite a long time. Um, nine to 12 uh, and I say 9 to 12 sets, and generally for me, it's about 12 for major muscle groups. But when I say that, some people get triggered because they feel like it's not enough. But if you look at all the body parts, all right, major, minor, et cetera, and then you factor in the potential of calves or abs or traps or all that kind of good stuff, or if your forearms are lagging, if you're doing more than 9 to 12 per major body part, more than 6 to 9 for minor body parts, you're going to have to put in a lot of time in the gym. Robert, any thoughts? No, you, you nailed it, Steve. I got nothing else, man. All right. Thank you. Uh, let's see. What do we got here? Ahmad Ali. Hey, man, I got some tightness in my glutes. I would have your partner uh, give you a massage every single night. Uh, but let's, let's stick to the question. It irritates when I lift my left leg. Any advice? Um, I guess... I would, the first thing I'd ask, is it in your glute or is it related to your hip? Because a lot of bad things in life come from your hip. I've never heard anybody having, having tightness in their glutes. I'm not a doctor. I really don't know how to address that question. Uh, you know, the only thing I would recommend is if you're tight, you probably want to take a nice, luxurious hot bath frequently to see if it'll loosen up. If it's a recurring problem, you need to see a doctor. Uh, foam rolling could probably be a plan of attack as well. Any thoughts, Robert? Yeah, tightness in the glute. I mean, it could be it could be the glute uh, medius, minimus, or maximus. I mean, there's there's three different glute muscles in there. If it's tightness in the glute, the one that I've had issues with, it's kind of like one of those little bands that band of muscles that is beneath the glute, the piriformis that can get really tight and cranky in people. 
Um, so I've dealt with some issues from that over the years. It, or it could be the, the glute medius, which tends to be weak in a lot of people that don't do a lot of lateral work or you know, like side lunges and stuff like that. Check it out with that. Maybe do some foam rolling, some hip stretches. You can look up like the figure four hip stretch and check that out. But if it is something that is chronic and severe or like a sharp pain, go see a doctor. It's impossible for us to, to diagnose or even, you know, hypothesize what it could be. Right. Way too complex. Um, before we move forward, guys, we just hit the hour mark. We'll be on as long as you have questions. Just a reminder, Robert is the supplement engineer. You can check out his podcast, his Instagram, his YouTube, his website, the supplement engineer. If we miss your question, you can slide into his DM on Instagram at the supplement engineer, and Robert will be glad to help. All right, follow 68. If I lose gains, will I lose gains? Um, you know, Robert, I've been lately, I've been uh, trying to see what I can bring my bench press up to mm -hmm. uh, in the 40 rep range. <laughs> okay. So, damn. My goal is to, my goal really is to get to November when I do my uh, 100 mile attempt and be able to bench 225 by 40 as well. Uh, just to show people, you know, you can have strength and you can run a stupid long distance. So, um, it's been a recurring theme. Like people are so panicked that I'm going to lose an incredible amount of muscle mass. If anything, you know, I feel as big as ever right now and I'm not exactly training hard. Uh, so maybe it's that athlete X supplement protocol. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I think people need to remember that the human body is built to endure all kinds of shit and it, it works really hard to, obtain and master adaptations it's not going to be very willing to just dispose of them and dump them at a moment's notice this is why you can go years without riding a bicycle and then you also you can just hop back on and do it again once you once the body has achieved a certain adaptation that's hardwired into you both neurologically and down at the cellular level inside your muscle it might shrink a little bit but it's going to come back really quickly so you're not going to lose it permanently and so i'm you know it's I think the, the muscle loss, muscle wasting thing has been kind of overblown, but I mean, that's probably part of part in large part, the supplement industry's fault for saying, if you're not consuming BCAAs every four and a half minutes, you're not going to, you're going to go catabolic, bro. Yeah. I mean, the, the industry, the lifting and supplement industry and nutrition industry, especially in bodybuilding, um, wants to make you think you're this fragile little, uh, you know, Cinderella. Yeah. That if you don't do anything, everything at a specific time, at a specific amount, that you know, you need us to tell you when to do everything. Right. It's really the opposite. If you just do the basics consistently, you don't need jack shit. That's that's really the biggest secret in the industry. Correct. And um, the body is not this fragile little house of glass. And I am not some genetic freak. I'm not. You know, I yeah. was skinny fat when I was eight years old. I, was, I looked like shit. Um, so anyway, if you lose gains, you will, but you can get them back. Art Van Vandalay. Hey, yeah, I, I'm That's learning. Seinfeld reference. Yeah, I got you. Um, Scott McEarlene. Yeah, some of the names are in Gaelic. One of the most uh, one of the most enjoyable aspects of traveling through some of the areas of Scotland was to see Scottish Gaelic on the signs because they'd have uh, you know the English form of word and then they'd have the Scottish Gaelic, which was pretty much real close. But it was always interesting that that was still on a lot of the signs. Uh, Carlos Morris, thanks for asking my question. You're welcome, Carlos. Thank you for joining us, Jeremy O. The big O. I feel like I have a hard time connecting with my traps during shrugs. Tips for traps work. Okay, Robert, I'm going to have my say and then I'll let you jump in. Um, the traps are an interesting muscle group because they have a limited range of motion. With a limited range of motion, uh, inherently they have a limited time under tension or contract or you know time under time under tension per rep. So. What that means to me is when I'm programming traps, generally I go a little bit more higher reps uh, because you have to kind of bring up the time under tension a little bit, especially for anybody that's 
struggling with traps. This could mean increasing set volume or increasing sets or whatever. That's why I have protocols like Power Shrug Hell, where you put you do you do the bar for ten or eight, you put on forty fives, you do it for eight to ten, you put on another forty fives, do it for eight to ten, and then you can start moving up by twenty fives or whatever. But you end up going up and then pyramiding down. It's like a superset or rest pause. You can do a lot of volume in a short period of time. Um, don't worry about feeling the traps. I'm going to tell you my opinion, and, and and Robert might hate me or disagree with me, but the traps are one of the strongest muscle groups in the human body. You need to overload those son, sons of guns. All this little time, you know, the, the mind-muscle connection for traps isn't, you know, it's got, they have to be attached to heavy ass weight at some point with volume to get them to respond. I've, I've never, never, never seen somebody do these light little 50 pound shrugs to infinity and gain any noteworthy traps. All the big traps I've seen are in big ass heavy lifters who just punish them. Robert, any thoughts? Crushed it, Steve. I've got zero, zero uh, things to add to that. You, you nailed everything I was going to say and, and then some. So, yeah. Like the biceps are kind of the opposite. You know, uh, yeah. I can't, biceps are a lighter movement. I like to focus on contraction. One of my clients, uh, I have a client um, in, in China, uh, Singapore. Uh, she's from Singapore. And uh, her curls were too uh, uh, filled with momentum. So I'm like, slow it down. Make sure you're getting, uh, you know, a good uh, good contraction. You're, you're getting some good time under tension. Don't swing your curls because you're really not doing anything other than powering it. Try and do some heavy loaded carries too. Do some farmer's walks, Jeremy. That'll put a huge amount of time under tension on there with some heavy ass weight. Yeah, right. Exactly. Um, one of the things I do as well, if you can't find time to, you know, between deadlifts and RDLs and shrugs, sometimes you find you're just loading plates on the bar ad nauseum. Yeah. Uh, one of the things you can do, uh, is you could do deadlifts, and then when your deadlifts are done, uh, you could uh, just strip a plate and start doing shrugs. Mm -hmm. Or when you're doing RDLs, after your RDL set is done, uh, start doing shrugs to failure with the weight you're doing with RDLs without setting the bar down. So you already have the time under tension on your traps are a little bit pre-fatigued from your RDLs, and you can hop right into shrugs. So just a couple quick tips. Yep. All right. I like this question. Because I've been, I, I got my eye on this guy, and I got to figure out, um, I got to dive into more of his content. He came up on my feed, and I realized he's approaching four hundred thousand subscribers. And there's a, and I'm just going to say, there's a couple things that he said that kind of made me nervous. Okay, uh, he's he was doing a pull up video where his arm is completely uh, bent through the whole thing, and it's more like. I don't know if you can see it. Let me do this, okay? So he was showing a pull-up where your arm is bent and you're just kind of doing it like, like a, you're just using your arm bent. And I'm like, hmm. that's a lot of stress on the biceps. Yeah. And uh, no one can do that other than five people, right? That's a lot of body weight strength. Yeah. So I'm not condemning Ryan Humiston. Um what I'm saying is that's the first video I've seen by him, and it set off alarms. Uh, uh, that doesn't mean 99% of what he's saying is shit. Far from it. 1% uh, of what I say is bullshit, right? And I'll probably wake up tomorrow and learn it's bullshit and evolve my training. But when that's kind of a big thing. So I've yet to dive into everything he says. But, you know, Robert, are you familiar with him at all? No clue who the guy is. He's uh, he's got muscle mass, mm -hmm. um, relatively quality degree of leanness, and he's got the beard, and he looks like he's straight out of uh, you know uh, the three hundred, you know, the gotcha. Spartan movie. So he looks the part, and uh, he looks very very masculine. So um, he's like what Athlete X would look like if Athlete X was manly. That's just humor, kids. That's just humor. All right. Um, it's just it's just a joke. All right. So, uh, um, but he looks the part, and you want to just follow behind him lockstep because he looks the part. But yeah. 
Uh, we really, he's somebody you really need to dive into. That's all I'll say. Okay. Uh, Paul DeVito. I'm, I'm going to take so much shit over that athlete next comment. I swear to God, I will. It, it's just, it's just him. That's going to be the next internet war. Greg, remember, you said just got blown past for the big hairy ugly dude. Yeah. You remember when guys could actually take a joke and not get offended? Yeah. Those days I've been gone with, uh, with common sense and everything else. It's when social media hit and SEO, that's when, uh, being sarcastic went out of style. All right, Paul DeVito, resistance bands are great combined with free weights. Uh, by themselves, not so much. Um, resistance bands are a hard road, you know, by themselves. Uh, I think we talked about this maybe our first uh, live video. Robert, uh, you want to rehash that a little bit? Yeah, it's – Um, I just – I think bands – have limited utility, but if I had to choose between using just bodyweight exercises or just resistance bands, I'm going to go with just bodyweight exercises. Combined, they can be great. I just, resistance bands get hardest at the point of the exercise where it's are typically already hardest on your muscles, making it that much more complicated. So when you're doing a row, the row is hardest when, you're, when your arm is getting back behind the torso and you're trying to contract there. That's also the point of highest tension on the band. So that's going to, in order, and then when your arm is fully extended, there's hardly any tension on it at, at, at all, yet a loaded stretch is one way to induce hypertrophy into a muscle. So the bands are kind of running counter to that, what you're trying to get there. Um, are they are they worthless? No. Uh, they're usually fairly cheap. They don't take up a lot of space. They're, they're, they are versatile, and they do serve a purpose, but I, I don't think I would much rather have free weights or body weight exercises if uh, push came to shove. Yeah, you know, I, I have bands here, and, and we use them. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I do too. In the home gym, I have the door bands, and I, I do 15-rep uh, sets of banded cable crossovers. Yeah, I can get a really good feel when I use all four bands, but I got to stand like a mile away from the door right? just so I have that tension from, uh, you know, from the get-go. So you can use them, but they're not my favorite thing, not my favorite thing to do. Yeah. Uh, Jim Bro, I want to give a sincere apology to both of you. I'm busy today and not going to be able to provide you with any inane questions or obscure references. Uh, I hope your busyness continues so we do not have any more inane questions or obscure references. And that's just humor. Thank you. I, I'm offended. I don't get any more asinine questions and inane remarks. I'm offended. Uh, Larry S., is pre workout uh, as safe as coffee? That's kind of a broad stroke there, Robert, so I'll let you have that. It really depends on what ingredients are in the pre-workout. Um, I mean, you, you could make the argument that pre-workout has artificial sweeteners, where if you're just drinking black coffee, there's nothing artificial in it. I mean, but we've got data on the artificial sweeteners being you know, safe for human consumption, even in fairly uh, heavy doses. Um, do I think it's as safe as coffee? If the caffeine contents are, you know, roughly equivalent, sure. And plus some pre-workouts have vasodilating ingredients that promote blood flow and circulation and stuff like that. Uh, so, yeah, and that way it's, you know, it's, it's helping the cardiovascular system. I don't want to say it's good for the cardiovascular system because I guess you could consider that a health claim. It's, a, it's you know, it, it's not harming that. If you start having some of the weird ingredients, the, the really uh, harsh stimulants like DMAA, DMHA, amp citrate, which we really don't have any quality human data on, I would not say in that case pre workouts are as safe as coffee. Um, plus, there's all you, there. You also have to run the risk of getting a quality pre workout from a company because we've seen time and time again there are these shitbag companies in the industry that it's either them or it's their contract manufacturers that are not testing the products and they're lacing them with all kinds of illicit illegal compounds that could be hazardous, toxic when consumed in copious amounts. So in that instance, you know, it, it really is depends on a case by case basis and what the ingredients are in it that you're looking at. If you have a specific question, you know, shoot me an email or a message and I can tell you my thoughts on that specific product. Yeah, the only thing I was going to add to that is when it comes to supplements, and Robert, I'd like your opinion on this generic statement. And first, I'd like to know if you're still awake because I don't know if you got enough. You didn't get enough sleep last night. No, I'm uh, good. I got a, a 400 milligram caffeine pre workout that I'm about halfway through. So yeah, I'm definitely I'm I'm good to go. All right. So when it comes to supplements, I'm going to say you're better off spending money on a more premium product from a more reputable company that actually puts time and effort, been in the industry for a while. 
Uh, maybe the flavor is a little bit better. Uh, would you agree or disagree, Robert? Absolutely. I would say m m most of the time, unless it's like one of those trim fast keto things that we were just talking about, which are overpriced or Vince Del Monte's shit can supplement. Um, you know, most of the time when you're dealing with supplement companies, you pay for what you get. So those little BOGO pre-workouts that you always see advertising, you get spammed in your inbox for those are prop blended, pixie dusted, underdosed, heaping, steaming piles of dog shit as far as a pre-workout. And there's a good chance they, they might have some uh, other compounds in there that you would rather not have. Uh, so, yeah, you get what you pay for. Always look for a transparently dosed product if possible. I will tell you, I haven't spent a lot of time in the industry. Um, when you see a BOGO or buy one, get one half off or something like that, either it's a shit product that doesn't sell that they're trying to dump. Um. Or it's bodybuilding.com whoring out a brand and devaluing the brand just so they can bring in a, a bottom line. Like big, big thing, big players like uh, bodybuilding.com and Walmart and Amazon and stuff like that. Having your brand on there seems like a wonderful thing. Yep. But these companies are great at destroying the value of a brand. If you have a really good product um, – and all of a sudden, bodybuilding.com wants to do a BOGO and slice you to bits and buy your product for nothing. Uh, you know, I don't know why I decided to go on that <laughs> down that uh, rabbit trail. But when you, when you support companies like that, you know, they're they're really destroyers of brands. And, um, you yeah. know, especially in the supplement industry. But outside of the point is outside of bodybuilding.com and, and places like that, that'll do a BOGO and buy one, get one half off. If you see that on a site uh, with a, with a pre-workout or whatever the supplement is, usually it's something that doesn't sell at all. And they're trying to get it out of stock. Correct. Usually that's a generalization. Yeah. Uh, ben Adventures today is meal prep day. Ben, it's probably a good idea to do it on Friday when you got a lot of energy. Uh, Stan says mini disc. Not sure what uh, that means. Maybe you can clarify. I think that was from the, the DVD Blu-ray uh, oh. progression of stuff. Yeah, I got you. Uh, Tyler, howdy from Georgia. Hope you guys are doing well. How's it going, Tyler? Hope you uh, you got some good stuff going on this weekend. Uh, HD DVD came out uh, same time as Blu-ray. Uh, so yeah, there we go. Yeah, that might be it. Wild Turkey 108 is my go to bourbon. Never tried it. I haven't. I've heard good things though. Uh, the basic Wild Turkey scares me, but <laughs> uh, I've never tried any of their more quality products. All right, here we go. What do we got here? Jeremy O, oh, how would you structure a five day plan to hit everything twice? How would I do it? Um, I would do it on a rotating A, B type of plan where you're doing A, B, A, B, A, B, A, B. Uh, I'd have an, up, an A, B split. You can slice it however you want. Uh, upper, lower, I like to do legs and back on the A split and chest, shoulders, and arms on the B split. doesn't really matter. But what I would do is I like to do uh, two chest and shoulder workout variations and two leg and back workout variations and rotate. So – you do A, B, C, D, and you'd keep rotating between those over the course of a five-day plan. What you got here is you got two variables. You're trying to hit everything twice over the course of five days, which makes the math interdasting, okay? So you got to get a little bit creative. That's what I would do. That's what I would do. Uh, Robert, anything, any thoughts on that? Yeah, just to give them a, a separate option. Because I like I like what you do, and that that legs and back thing. I mean, it's that's one of the the workout structures that I've always liked. But man, it can be as you start getting stronger, it it turns into a ball buster of a workout compared to the the, the previous day, which is you know all of the other muscles. Um, anyway, one I know in a way a little, another way you could organize it is to do um, legs push pull, then have an off day, and then do lower upper. Right. So structure your, your second thing. So you're hitting everything twice. Your upper body day, that second upper body day could be more like a pump day. Or you could even structure it, I guess, do lower upper. Sorry, wait. Upper, lower, rest day, pull, push, legs. And you could do it that way too. To where your first, your first upper and lower days are your heavier days. And then like the back three days, the, the push, pull, legs 
is more of like your pump work and your higher rep stuff, like in the 10 to 20 rep range. And you, your first couple of days in the week are like six to 10. This got my juices going a little bit because I'm thinking about this. Like you got the three major lifts, all right? Mm -hmm. You got the bench and the squat and the deadlift. And then also, you yeah, also have the military press. But, um, you know, I'm thinking you could do a heavier, uh, when I say heavier, more compound focus movements for three days. Uh, let's say you do squat on Monday. Let's say you attack chest and uh, shoulders, uh, bench and military press on Tuesday, uh, maybe squats on Wednesday and some stuff to back it up and then take a day off and then come in the next two days and maybe do more lighter uh, machines, isolation stuff. The key is, though, going to be planning your rest days because you need to be fresh going into whatever is starting the cycle again on yep. the Monday. All right, Robert, I'm going to let you lead the dance with this one. I'm going to share my opinion. 100 grams of protein sufficient enough for an adult male trying to build muscle? Not even close unless you're, you know, a 98-pound adult male. I mean, that's, that's, that's going to be woefully insufficient. Yeah, I mean, um, the gentleman, Jim Bro, that's on here saying he didn't want any inane questions is actually quite a, a client of mine. And I busted his balls this week because he's had he had like two days of 110 grams and one day of 94 grams. I'm constantly busting his nuts because he's eating he's not eating enough protein and he, he trains hard. Um, you know, the Mike Mentzer guys and the fringe guys that try to seek extremes, low protein, high protein. There's no good reason at all not to stay within reasonable guidelines and reasonable levels. None at all. Don't seek fringe stuff. Don't seek, you know, uh, opposite ends of the spectrum. Just be reasonable. Yeah. If you're struggling to get into your protein, for the love of God, you know, uh, take in a shake, um, have a Greek yogurt, mm -hmm. eat a couple pieces of string cheese, uh, you know, something like that. I tell people uh, if they're like 5'10", my, my clients are around 5'10". I say aim for 150 grams. If they're shorter, 5'4", 5'5", 5'6", 130 is kind of the minimum for them. But then pretty much every male, I tell them, look, just gird up your big testicles and eat 150 grams of protein a day at least. And Yeah, one gram per pound. Just keep it simple. If you, if you weigh 150 pounds, have 150 grams of protein. 170 gram, pounds, have 170 grams of protein. Just, just keep it simple that way. Right. And when people start going below 150, that's kind of like my flinch zone. And when they're below 130, I want to slap them. Uh, Justin, are bro splits optimal for hypertrophy? Justin, we co uh, covered this earlier. Um, and I I'd ask you to rewind because we don't want to, you know, uh, dive into this and repeat ourselves over and over again. But um, frequency training focuses on one variable, and that's frequency. There are many more variables. I will say 99% of the successful lifters I've met in my life use bro splits, and that triggers people. But it's it's reality. It's absolutely reality. That's changing nowadays because more and more people are doing upper lowers and, and stuff like that. But um, optimal applied over the course of three, four, five years, it's not going to matter as much as long as you are using a good exercise selection, a reasonable amount of volume, progressive overload, your diet's consistent, and you are in attack mode. Robert, anything to add? Nope. You summed that up our previous discussion swimmingly, Steve. Get a lot stronger than you are now. Uh, Nigel, apparently it was on Shark Tank and they bought it hook, line, and sinker. I guess we're talking about uh, the keto product. I will say that if I was on Shark Tank, I would probably buy it too because Shark Tank is a business uh, program yeah. and they're looking to make money. And if you have a point of differentiation in the keto market that can potentially make you a lot of money, they don't care about results. They care about making money. Anything to add, Robert? No. I mean, they're, they're smart for business investors. They see that the common person is going to buy up anything that's labeled as quick weight loss, rapid weight loss, you know, easy fat loss, anything like that. So they're just making a smart business move. It's not a voucher saying it's a quality product or anything like that. It's a scam. It's a billion dollar industry. And if you have anything that has a strong point of differentiation, I would probably buy it as well. Yeah. 
Uh, Chris, Chris, can you recommend a multivitamin brand? Because there's a lot and it's confusing. I believe Chris, Chris is from the Philippines. So, uh, Robert, what are your uh, what are your recommended brands? The one, the one that I always lean to, the first one, is either uh, Animal Pack or Controlled Labs Orange Triad. And both of those are, are relatively easy to find, I believe. You, um, it's been a while since I've been at Tiger Fitness. Did uh, do you know if uh, MTS Nutrition ever released their big pack thing? Uh, I know MTS has a regular uh, multivitamin. Let me pull it up. It's their machine multi. Yeah, but uh, when I was there, they were talking about he he was talking about releasing some kind of an alternative to like the animal pack. I'm not sure if that ever came to fruition. Or I don't not. think I don't, I don't think I ever saw it. But the, I mean, the machine multi it uses my litmus test for multivitamins is checking out like the vitamin B12 and the magnesium forms, and they've got vitamin B12 as the cyanocobalamin, which is the less uh, bioavailable form, and magnesium oxide and zinc oxide. Both of those, anytime you see an oxide form of a mineral, it's generally the l lowest bioavailability, i.e., cheapest one around to yeah. use. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not super impressed with their, with their regular pill multivitamin. Um, I'm trying to see if, if their powder multi is any better. Eh, nah, no, I would stick with, um, Orange control or, uh, the animal pack one. Okay. Thank you, Robert. Uh, Ben on adventures. Oh, here we go. I'm <laughs> not being dismissive, Ben. Um, this is just one of my least favorite uh, questions in the lifting world. Thoughts on Bulgarian? My honest thoughts, Ben, and this is not directed at you. It's directed at anybody. Most people, most people don't need Bulgarian. Most people, most people are not in the same league as Bulgarian. Most people are playing t-ball. And Bulgarian is Randy Johnson in the bottom of the ninth in the World Series, tossing ninety-eight mile an hour fastballs your way, and you got to hit that shit. So that's my thoughts on Bulgarian. Um, you got to go from T-ball to the major leagues before you even consider Bulgarian. Robert, any thoughts? Yeah, it's it's it is a super advanced method that I the average person doesn't need and probably will get crippled. Not not actually crippled, but they will be in such pain and miserable muscle soreness uh that they won't survive the program it's just like somebody that's trying to jump onto like one of those higher volume shako routines that's not really prepped for it it's just it's gonna floor you if i <clears throat> excuse me too much talking and dog hair if i was a coach and i had to put 100 athletes through the grinder to spit out 10 oh that'd be a good program for it um you know, that I can tell you before you get into a program like that, you really need a lot of time with the iron. Like I, for over maybe two years, I did uh, frequency training, daily maxes with squats and bench and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And what I would do is I would see how I felt that day and I, I would do a single, double, triple or quad or whatever based on how I felt that day. But that was after, uh, you know, like <clears throat> 28 years of training. Yeah. Um, and still, physically, it was very dangerous. Physically, it was very dangerous. Uh, and it's, it, it has a potential. Can the reward be there? Yes. Is the risk increased? Yes. Uh, that's why you got to learn to get your at-bats in at a major league level before you even consider that. Correct. Uh, Scott McEarley, uh, internet ads. If I had a, if it has a young, attractive woman with her backside pointing to me and a heaving chest, I will admire the picture for a moment and ignore the snake oil supplement she's selling. Absolutely. There you go. Yeah. If somebody's resorting to, you know, tits and ass to sell something, that's their main selling point. Like you can use that to sell uh, balding cream or whatever. I mean, that's that's not a point of differentiation. Yeah, we can all appreciate though the uh, eye candy. Um, been an adventure, Sir Ian Holm from Alien, the Lord of the Rings, passed away. He was eighty-eight. I saw that this morning. It was sad to see that, but um, 
did happen. So I, I, you're not the only one that noticed that. Tyler, hit the dumbbells hard. And for volume day, like you advised, Big Harry Ugly Dude, one of the best pumps from Push Day I've ever had, hands down. Thanks for the advice. I'm glad it helped. Get some sleep, and you guys have a, have a great weekend. Uh, day off with AMRAP push-ups. Need to get minimum 60 and two minutes. That's a pretty good mark, but it's doable. I think I did that in the military. I think I got like 72 or something like that. So uh, just stay at it. Guards, XBL. For frequency volume example, if I do 15 to 18 sets on chest on Monday, should I be able to do another 15 to 18 sets on Thursday? If you're doing a hard 15 to 18 sets on, on Monday and it's quality volume, um, look, just because you can do something doesn't mean it's the best way, okay? Um. I can slap a pit bull with my testicles, but it's not the most efficient way of getting its attention. Okay. Uh, I can slap my dick in my wife's face and it's a good way to get her attention, but it's not the best way to get her attention. Just because I don't know, Robert, we've been going for two. <laughs> All right. Just because you can do something doesn't mean it's the best way. Is it possible? Yeah, if you're young and got a lot of recovery. But I'm going to tell you, it's going to beat the living shit out of your body. I did a push-pull legs when I was uh, 20. I dove into that. Beat the living shit. I could do that for like four months. Beat the living shit out of my, bo my body. It beat the living shit out of my body. If that is all quality work, you can do it, but probably not, not for very long. Robert, any thoughts on slapping your wife in the face with a penis? Or... <laughs> Oh, that made my morning. Thank you, Steve. All right. Sorry, Thank you. Guys. Sometimes Thank you, sir. That's, I mean, that's, that's a shit ton of volume, even by like high volume standards. That's 30 to 36 sets a week. I, I don't think I, I, you really, unless you were like some super like genetic outlier or like super low responder to training, you shouldn't need that much volume. If you can do it, that's great. But I mean, what's the quality of those, that 18th set on Monday for chess? I mean, are you by this point? Is that like your sixteenth time trying to go for like a pec deck or a cable crossover or something? If you're if you're really pushing hard, can you really get in fifteen hard, high quality sets on a single muscle group and then repeat that three days later? I I'm inclined to think not, unless you got like superhuman recovery or you know you got some extra special sports supplements coursing through your veins. The first thing I want to know when I get a question like this is what are your strength levels on your main lips? OK, because uh, and I, do, I hate to generalize, but this is the case most often when somebody is trying to interject volume into free combined volume and frequency. Most times they're pretty weak uh, and they they're able to do that a lot easier. So invariably, when we talk about this stuff, somebody's going to drop a comment saying I can do that. Well, yes, you can do that. For a short period of time, if you're reasonably strong, but if you're not strong at all and you're not pushing for progression, you probably can do that because you're using a lot of junk volume. So um, I would have to know more information. I'd really like to know your strength levels on your major lifts. That would help because m more than you need 30 plus sets for chest, you need 12 to 15 set a week where you're getting the most out of your barbell and dumbbell and dips and all that kind of good stuff so i hope yeah. that helps hey, steve before you go to that one there's a the most recent comment that popped up at the bottom of the feed from b fluis says am i the only person being skipped go ahead and reiterate your spiel about skip questions yeah uh anybody that thinks they're being skipped it is not us it is uh youtube and it happens every week <clears throat> so if you feel you're being skipped please post up your question it's a glitch. There's nothing we can do about it. It happens on every uh, uh, every content provider's live videos. I get emails about it every week telling me I'm losing money, I'm lo losing viewers. There's nothing I can do. Just keep posting up your question, and we will get to it. Uh, where are we? Ben on Adventures said he switched to sumo deadlifts. Uh, it feels great. I'm glad, Ben. It is, um, it's a trickier exercise. I feel at the top when you're trying to lock out that a sumo deadlift is a little bit more imbalanced naturally. 
Uh, but I think there's a lot of value in spending a lot of time with both. So, uh, Sturgios Savas, how's that? Is it really is it really a problem if I don't ro rotate exercises on A B training split like I do the same high quality exercises two times a week and I'm progressing? Is there really a reason to rotate? All right. So what what this gentleman is saying is, do I need to rotate exercises? Uh, can I just do bench, military press twice a week, squats, deadlifts twice a week? That is a question that is very exercise dependent. I do not want people deadlifting generally twice a week. Um, can you squat twice a week? Can you bench twice a week? Yes. Uh, is it, it depends on your goals. Is it the best for hypertrophy? I like exercise variation for a number of reasons. Um, different stimulus. Uh, feels different, different stresses on the muscle and joints. In the long run, I don't feel it's the best for hypertrophy. In the short run, is it doable? Absolutely. You can build a lot of strength on it. Robert, any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, it's if he wants to keep the same exercises, like if he's getting a good training stimulus with it, like in the muscle belly and he's not aggravating his joints, then that's fine. I would say you can do that twice a week, but you know, experiment with some different rep ranges. So if you know, you're going hard and heavy early in the week, going, working in like the, the six to eight rep range, Use those same exercises again later in the week if you want to, but you know, explore out into like the, the 10 to 20 rep range so you can get the benefits of training of training across a broad spectrum of rep ranges. Me personally, I like a little bit of variety in my training. I don't want to do 36 different exercises like P90X or something, but at the same time, I don't want to be doing just the same four, you know, day in and day out. So there, there's a happy medium in between that. But if you like, you know, just a basic core of set of like six or eight exercises, that's fine. But make sure to work in some different uh, rep ranges while you're doing those same exercises. Yeah, I would agree. When I have people squatting twice a week, um, you know, if I have to program in five by five twice a week, I would rather uh, stick a sharp pick in my eye or something. I mean, I, I don't, I, I, I find value in variation and I find we're able to learn a lot more about ourselves in the gym when we do variation. Um, Correct. Upset on squats is going to feel a lot different than five and, and so on and so forth. Right. But really, as long as your body is feeling okay and you're using compounds and progressing, you're fine. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks, Ben. Um, Logan, thoughts on companies that still use DMAA and DMHA? Uh, well, both of those uh, stimulants have been banned. Uh, I would be very suspect of any company that is claiming to use them in their product, considering that it's damn near impossible to actually get authenticated RAWs of that from China. So they might list it as DMAA or DMHA on the label, but the, the fact that the chance of those actually being that the, the chemicals that are in the pre-workout, it's, it's slim to none. It, there's almost no DMAA or DMHA actually being produced anymore. Um, it's it's going to be some other compound or some other alkaloid that they're just labeling as DMAA. But it's if you look at it chemically, it's and you ran it through a third party testing or like a mass spectrometer or something. It's there's there's no way. Robert, are any of these companies doing the old pro hormone trick where they're attaching uh, molecule X to, a you know, a, like DMAA, you know, changing its chemical formula to try to slide under the radar? That would probably be more in like the SARMs realm where they're doing that. I mean, a lot of the times what they're doing with the DMAA and DMHA is they're listing it, or what they used to do with DMAA at least, was they would list it as geranium oil extract or geranium leaf extract because that's one of the few plants that contains DMAA and very, very like minute, eensy, weensy, teensy, beansy little right. uh, amounts. Uh, DMHA, they they have different varieties of it. So there's like the harder hitting two amino five version of DMHA. And then there's the two amino six version. They'll list it as Juglans Regia, Walnut leaf extract, or Walnut bark extract. Um, that's, I'd be very wary of any, any products that are using those ingredients or openly labeling DMA or DMHA. I, it's not going to be those actual compounds. Those stimulants have gone the way of the dinosaurs. Thanks, Robert. Um, Philo, Biotest is a company I trust, right or wrong. I believe uh, Biotest is T Nation's brand, is it not? It is. I mean, it might be quality stuff, but it is so fucking expensive and overpriced. It's it's not worth my money. And the way, if you, if you read some of their their articles and the way they posit some of their supplements, it you would think it's God's gift to ultimate body recomposition, lose fat, build muscle stuff. It's so overhyped and overblown. 
uh, and a lot of their the dosing on some of the stuff that I've seen, especially like on their nootropics, I'm not a real big fan of. I will say I've been in the industry so long that, um, you know, I, I, I want to weigh in on just my time in the industry and biotests. Uh, for reference, there was one point where I, I went to New York uh, and did video work with Stu Yellen. Stu Yellen was, uh, I believe, a WNBF pro that was uh, a moderator or the huge name on T Nation. He was a sponsored athlete. I went to his apartment in Brooklyn and got the pet his dog, all that kind of stuff. And he had supplies and supplies of the biotest stuff. And, um, you know, T Nation is kind of dead nowadays. Uh, you know, I've never, outside of Stu Yellen, I've never met an athlete that uses it. That doesn't say you can't trust them, okay? Um, but it kind of makes me nervous that, you know, when you've been in an industry for a very long time and you have a powerhouse aside of T Nation, that you don't have people fanatical about a supplement line, uh, you know, when you meet people. Like when I meet people, they're all like, man, I love MTS or I love Optimum or whatever. I've never met a guy uh, that says I'm a huge biotest fan. Uh, so are they quality? Man, I don't know. I've been out of their loop for so, so long. I couldn't even tell you. Yeah, it's it's overpriced, overhyped, and I'm not super nuts about some of their formulations. Uh, there, there are much better options on the market for a much lower price. Give these guys a thumbs up. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, ben, lately I've been doing upper, lower accessories, lower, upper. I think I might switch back to five-time full body. Five-time a week full body can be fun, you know, when you need a little bit of a change. So uh, just have fun with it and try to eat, put in some exercise variation. Jeremy O, oh, thanks for your time each week and answering my questions. We appreciate each and every one of you guys uh, following us. So thank you. It's two grams of protein per pound. Okay, Robert. Yeah, I mean, they've done studies with giving people between like 3.2 to 4 uh, grams per kilogram of body weight, which is around two grams of protein per pound uh, a day. Yes, it's okay, provided that your, your kidneys are, are functioning just fine. If you have a bad kidney or down to one kidney, uh, I wouldn't recommend it. But by then, I point you're probably getting specialized dietary advice from your doctor and uh, RD anyway. Um, yeah, yeah, it's fine. Are you going to get, you know, drastically superior muscle growth compared to just eating one or one and a half grams of protein per day? No, but if, if you enjoy it and it helps keep you filled, go for it. Uh, you know, the one thing I'll add to this discussion, um, a lot of my male clients, you know, probably maintain that 2,200 to 2,500 calories a day. Let's mm -hmm. say 2,300 to 2,500. Yeah. Um, yeah. And when you are looking at that in context, if that's you, um, you're looking at half your calories, nearly half your daily calories from protein. I don't have a problem with that as long as you're getting in an appropriate amount of fat content, you know, in your diet, yeah. um, that you're not under eating fat or avoiding fat to the point where it's going to uh, impact your health. Right. And if, if they're eating things like red meat or, or fatty fish, then they probably should, they would probably be getting, be getting enough fat just through that without having to add more on that. But if you, if you're eating just like turkey breast and chicken breast then or tilapia, then you, you're going to need to add fat somewhere. Um, just to let you know, guys, we got, uh, this is a last call for questions. We got some in the queue, but I'm going to do a last call now. If you want to get your question answered, get it in now. When we run out, we run out. Yeah. Steve, highlight Saran. Uh, it's 1144. It's near the bottom. So it says it's been skipped twice. Um, uh, I've been skipped twice. Again, Saran, we're not skipping your question. Please post it up now. We're not skipping it. That's the first message I've seen by you. So I just want to encourage your question. Uh, Beef says he's the only person being skipped. No, you're not. We're not skipping you again. It's just like this. It's just the way YouTube is. So get, get your questions in, guys, because we're about to pull the parachute. If we do miss your questions, feel free to head over to Instagram, at Ben the Barman, at Ben the Barman. Sign in my DM. I answer every question. I'm get, I get hammered on my inbox, so give me sometimes up to a week, but I will get to it. <coughs> Excuse me. Suggestion to those viewing the chat, if you aren't doing it, be sure to change to live chat instead of top chat. I didn't even know there was such a thing. 
<coughs> excuse me. All right. If I do box squats to depth, is it identical to regular squatting, touch, and go? I got some thoughts on this, Robert. Before I get into it, uh, do you have anything you'd like to uh, add to that question? I I don't say I wouldn't say it's identical. No, the 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 trajectory you're doing with a box squat is going to put your body in a different position because uh, you tend to go backwards more, whereas regular squatting it's more of like an up and down thing. Box squatting you're sitting back into something. The force distribution is going to be different in the body. I wouldn't say it's it's at all the same thing or identical. No, it it, it has its own benefits, but it's not the same thing as regular squatting. You touch on a very important point and something I something I tell everybody about when it comes to box squatting. When you're squatting, you aren't really thinking about putting your butt down onto something. When you do a box squat, people tend to be more hips back. It changes the weight distribution, like Robert says. It changes the mechanics of a squat. Uh, even if you're a super disciplined squatter, it, it will change the mechanics of the squat to a small degree. I find that because of this, um, some lifters have a tendency to pick up things like knee tendonitis because they are putting more, more stress and strain. Uh, they're changing their form. Uh, they're going more hips back and butt down. So you have to really, really be careful and really pay attention uh, and realize your, fo your form on squats is going to be box squats is going to be a little bit different than regular squats. So just know that going in. Um, can box squats help your regular squat? Yes. Can they help your deadlift? Yes. Are they a miracle cure? Well, sometimes in this industry, we swing from the nuts of guys like Ripito and Louis Simmons. Things like this certainly have their place, and some of the best people in the world use them. But uh, just know that they are different. Your form is going to be different. The weight distribution is going to be different. So just be careful. And if you start to experience anything like uh, knee tendonitis, pull back. I'm an experienced squatter. When I move over to box squats, invariably – it's easy for me. It had been easy for me to pick up knee tendonitis until I mastered the box squat. So there are some nuance, nuances and differences. All right, Michael G. Any chance of the part three or four program, the massive iron weight? Yes, there is a chance. Uh, I started a series uh, on how to program, how I program, and I got the first two parts in. And honestly, um, I got derailed a little bit. Whenever I do a series on, um, you know, each video, I, the deeper into the series I get, the, the fewer and fewer people actually watch the videos. So I think it might, what I'm thinking about doing is just putting together a longer video and doing it that way. That way um, people will get all the information in one video. Thanks, Ben. Have a good weekend. Uh, what's your recommended for total number of sets per week per body part? Guards, I want you to go back in time a couple days. I put together a video about junk volume. It covers that. Uh, just to quickly recap, if you look at your major body parts, chest, shoulders, back, legs, quads, and then your minor body parts, and I say minor, but hamstrings are not minor, but in programming uh, context, you don't do 15 sets per week for hamstrings generally. Biceps, triceps, traps, abs, calves, hamstrings, all that kind of good stuff. If you're doing more than 9 to 12 sets per major body part and 6 to 9 per minor body part, you'll have to live in the gym five days a week, probably 22 to 25 sets per, per body part. So for major body parts, 9 to 12, minor body, body parts, 6 to 9, mileage may vary. Go back and watch my video on junk volume. Uh, Philo, thanks guys for the information. A fool and his money are easily parted. I've uh, parted with my money many, many times over impulse purchases. Most people have. Yeah. Um, John Nurse, I've never been skipped. I just show up and have no questions. Well, well we thanks for showing up, John. Yeah, we appreciate everyone. Uh, Saran, I'm a novice. Body weight 68 kilograms. Uh, SBD squats, bench, deadlifts, 170, 130. Should I run your 531 program or 55 program? If it's 531, how can I buy it now as it's unavailable? Uh, it still exists. Um, 
it's it's out there. All you have to do is search Steve Shaw 531. I believe I might even have it in my uh, store at Super Living Today for a buck ninety nine. If you can't find it, head over to Instagram at Ben the Barman at Ben the Barman, and I will find it for you. I'm looking at your lips and I'm processing your weight, Robert. What is what is sixty eight times two point two? That's one thirty six with one fifth. That's like one hundred fifty pounds. Okay. Yeah, one forty nine point six. All yeah. right. Not bad for an old math nerd. Um, yep. Uh, squat, you're squatting 225, deadlifting, you're close to 300, uh, and bench, you're 170-ish, whatever. Um, I wouldn't consider you a novice. Uh, I'd consider you a late beginner. A novice is somebody still learning to ride the tricycle. You're you're on two wheels right now. So what program should you run? Doesn't matter. It absolutely doesn't. They're both good programs. You've established the ability to build strength beyond the beginner levels, so it won't really matter, just being honest with you. I would choose a program that is sexiest to you and run like a scalded dog. Uh, Robert, we're almost done. Justin E., when I, when, when I do conventional deadlifts with a 10-millimeter belt, I feel like I have trouble getting in position due to the belt getting in the way. I place the belt around the center of my belly button. Uh, we're talking about a deadlift. Justin, the first thing I would, the, the question I would have for you is what's your body weight? Um, generally, generally, and I don't know if this is a case, so this would kind of help us. Are you a bigger boy? Because getting in a position can sometimes be a struggle for a bigger, beefier, sexier man critter. So um, if you're not a bigger boy, uh, I'd like to see you you trying to get into position. So if you could send me a video, that would be help. Uh, any thoughts on that, Robert? I have never used a belt before, so no, I have nothing to add there. All right. Um, is there a position where a belt could be positioned too high where the belt won't serve its intended purpose? I've seen some people on deadlifts bring it pretty pretty high. I've, I've competed with guys like the Lilla Bridges who jacked that up there. I think it's personal preference. Um, if you can't get in a position, I would definitely adjust the belt position. But again, I'm curious about your body weight and I'd like to see a video because that would help me more than, than anything. All right. Last question. I always work out fasted. If not, I often get diarrhea. I've been checked. GI system is fine. Primary doctor says it's okay. Anyone else with this? Robert, you, have you run into this at all? Uh, no, if anything, and I've always been a person that likes to train on a, on an empty stomach, uh, whether I was act technically fasted according to like insulin levels and stuff. I mean, that that's here and there, there, but especially going back to like Taekwondo when we were going for like 90 minutes to an hour or to two hours of like high intensity, lots of punching kick combinations. I never liked anything in my system. I always felt nauseous when I did. I've never gotten diarrhea from it. Um, but, you know, if you're finding something that is that then maybe just like sip on some aminos or some carbs intra workout, if, if you're doing an extensively long workout, um, and that'll they'll usually those, those are a little bit easier on the GI system. Also, I guess consider if you're taking a lot of caffeine in your pre-workout, that is going to have a laxative effect. It, it can irritate the stomach lining, especially if you're fasted. Um, so give that a consideration. But if, if, if you enjoy working out fasted, that's fine. And if it's not hindering your performance, then, then rock on. The only thing, I'm, there's a couple of questions I have, and it's probably too much for us to dive into here, but um, if you typically work out fasted and then you're playing around with eating more food uh, or eating pre-workout, that could have uh, a chain, that that small change alone could cause an issue. Um, you know, so I would, if that's the case, you know, uh, that might be one of the causes. Sometimes smaller changes in, in diet doesn't seem like it's a big deal, but it could be. Um, the pre-workout issue as well. I've never had an issue working out fasted. I work, I worked out fasted for a very long time. The body adapts well. All I can say is all we can play with is the variables that we are aware of. And, uh, the body is a very complex, uh, you know, thing. And if that's the case, um, I might, the only thing I might play around with is eating a little bit earlier in the day. Right. So if you really find your energy is lacking from a fasted workout, and if you're eating an hour, an hour and a half before workout, maybe try three hours and see 
if that makes any difference. Yeah. Watch your uh, fat intake too, especially with that pre-workout meal. That might be greasing the tracks a little bit too. Greasing the old tracks. Saran, I, I haven't bought 531 program yet, but I took a look at your 5x5 five five and I felt like it had less volume than you recommend in your junk volume video. It could be. I mean, I make a myriad of programs, preferences. You can always add volume to a, uh, a program like that. Just keep that in mind. And um, for anybody that wants a program, you can head over to my website, which is right above my fat noggin. And I will modify a program for you. I will do a custom workout. So just keep that in mind. But Saran, the only thing I could say is you can always add volume to a 5x5. Five five. The reason why I don't rush in to add a lot of volume to a 5x5 five five is because once you're getting strong and you're doing five sets of five on squats or five sets of anything uh, with heavy weight, it can get really tedious really quickly for me. Yeah, and one other thing to consider is that what what is the goal of the program? Is it more of a power lifting program or is it a hypertrophy program? Because the volumes for each of those two programs is going to be different. Or if you're doing a hybrid, like a power building program, like most of your programs are, Steve, the volume is going to fall somewhere in between because the, you're not going to do the same amount of sets per week if your goal is hypertrophy versus if it's strength. Yeah, I mean, if you're doing, uh, if you look at some of these classic five by five programs, um, you're looking at at least ten sets of squats and ten uh, sometimes. You know, rip a toe, you know, seven and a half uh, sets per week of uh, military press or bench press. You already got a lot of volume in there already, set volume. Right. You might not have the rep volume. Um, so if you're doing like five by five twice a week on squats, you might only have room for another leg exercise, uh, you know, to squeeze in there. Like on a uh, uh, middle day like w whatever your leg exercise is. So that's generally why you don't, you might not have the rep volume, but you might already have the set volume. So just keep that in mind. Uh, Justin is 200 pounds and he's 5'8", and he has problems getting into position. Justin, the only thing I can say is I'd like to see a video of you squatting with and without a belt just to see what's going on. So if you can make that happen, I would appreciate it. 5068, back and buys, chest and tries, hams and thighs. No lies, guy. Give me some size. All right, that is a man after Ric Flair's heart. All right, guys, I appreciate you watching. Uh, me and Robert are here every Friday at 11 p.m. Eastern. Please follow Robert, the supplement engineer, on YouTube. Follow his podcast. Follow his Instagram. And head over to my website, Above My Big Fat Noggin, if you want a supplement assessment by Robert. You will get no better supplement assessment in the industry. I guarantee it. And just on an end, Beef Lewis says hi from Montana. If, you're tr if your name is Beef Lewis and you live in Montana, you are getting all the Montana pussy. All right. Have a great weekend, guys. <laughs> we'll see you next Friday. Bye, Steve. Thanks, guys. Bye.